apparently that was a false start. So good morning everybody to Gosainen. Uh, welcome to our garden where we've been recording moths for over 20 years now. We've got a, a good list of species. Uh, before we see what's in the moth traps, I'd like to show you... Uh, uh, but, um, uh, we've got various little devices to the left here uh, showing you how simple it really is. So this is a very basic trap. This is basically a bulb suspended over a box with a hole in it. So if you've got a stick, you can actually hold the light just over a hole in the box. You collect quite a lot of moths in the box, particularly if you put inside the box a whole load of egg cartons. So egg cartons, moth trappers collect egg cartons avidly because they're very useful. You basically just stack the egg cartons inside the box. The moths are attracted to the light. They fly in the hole and then um, they go to sleep on the egg cartons. And you get up in the morning, you can inspect to see what's in there. So this is let's say, a very basic box, which would cost you probably about, uh, well, if you just have an ordinary, you don't even need a, a, a specialist bulb. You can use an ordinary light bulb. Um, obviously the box would cost you nothing. This is just for a little bit of rain protection if it rains. Uh, and now you've got a, a moth trap for less than a fiver, basically. Um, this was um, an opportunistic purchase. This is actually a collapsible, a collapsible laundry basket. We do actually take this on holiday with us. It fits nice, neatly inside the suitcase. Uh, it pops up. I bought this five pound from, uh, I think it was Marks and Spencers. Um, a lampshade for two pound from uh, Wilkinson's. Modified slightly. Attach a bulb to it the wrong way up. That conveniently sits in there. You've got an instant moth trap for £7, plus the electrics of course. Alternatively, you can put the lampshade into a cardboard box, so you've got an alternative type of moth trap. All very, very cheap, uh, not very technical. Uh, if you want to spend a bit of money, you can buy... And you can put on different types of light fitting. So this is called an actinic tube, and you can get them to emit different types of uh, light. If you get them to emit ultraviolet light, they're generally better. Uh, but act actinic tubes are very, very useful because they don't emit an awful lot of, of visible light, so therefore they're not disturbing to neighbours. Uh, you can actually go for a, a more powerful option of a, a mercury vapour bulb. So this is a 125 watt mercury vapour bulb, which gives off a lot of UV light, which is especially attractive to moths. And this is, a, this is very good for pulling in large numbers of moths. The actual trap design is basically just a square box um, with two plastic vanes which sit inside the trap so when the moths are attracted to the light, whether it be the actinic tube or the bulb, the moths basically fly towards the light usually in a spiral. Eventually they'll sort of hit the baffles and drop down into the trap, again which must have filled with lots and lots of egg cartons. Um, so that's the Skinner trap. And then if you go a bit more expensive, this is what we ran last night, for a couple of Robinson traps. Um, this one was set in our garden, and just to ensure we had lots of moths, um, I also set one at Fleece Ninny, uh, RSPCA Centre, which is a nice uh, rural site where there's lots of woodland and grassland, etc. So this is absolutely full of moths, so we'll get to see that in a moment. As I mentioned, we, we live in a, an urban setting, so apologies for the noise of the traffic. We do live next to a quite a, a busy-ish road. Um, but if you are moth trapping, people say, oh, I can't put a moth light on because it annoys the neighbours. Well, if you, in, if you invest in a golfing umbrella, like this one here, you can basically set your moth trap wherever you want, and you can screen the light from your neighbour's garden or from your bedroom window just by putting a golfing umbrella down that. And I usually tether it with a bit of a rope. Some of the easy ways to do it. You can, of course, go into the countryside with a net and... Uh, and <coughs> okay. So now I've told you how to catch moths, I think we perhaps need to delve in and see what turned up in the trap last night. So I'm, I'm going to, um, I should say one thing, if you do record moths, it's really important you don't leave them exposed to the sunshine when they're in the trap, otherwise the trap will heat up, the moths will get very agitated and either fly off, or if they can't escape, they'll, they'll basically uh, exhaust themselves and die. So if you do catch moths, please don't leave your trap in the sun. And ideally, you want to get up early in the morning when it's nice and cool and the moths are very, very settled and you'll, you'll have more fun that. As I say, your cup of tea is essential at that time of day, so I'm just going to have a quick slurp. Ah, right, and we're ready to go. Okay, 
so as I say, this is a, a Robinson moth trap, which I've covered with a blanket, just to keep the moths nice and calm. Uh, if you can bring the camera here, son, we'll, we'll have a look inside. When you do set a moth trap, it's always worth checking on the grass around the moth trap. Uh, if you trap if you trap regularly, you find um, birds will quickly latch onto the fact there are moths around the trap. So it's important you get up early in the morning to clear the lawn of any moths which haven't actually gone in the trap. So I'm just going to take the phone a few seconds. And so, okay. So I'm just going to look. There's a nice clouded border moth just on the border of the funnel there, and then a little bit further down on the electrics. Um, uh, looks like a broken barred carpet there with it with a barely broken bar and just over here I'm going to go slightly upside down it's an awkward angle but this is a green carpet and focus it yeah green carpets very very beautiful you can see it's got lovely um, sort of pectinate antennae so this is presumably a male they use the antennae to find the females and that green coloration is always it's it's always sort of nice and bright on fresh specimens, but as the moth gets older, the green colour is quite unstable and tends to disappear. So anyway, that's just what's sitting on the outside. If you just keep the camera in the funnel sand, close to, I'll take the lid off. Well, the other thing is to turn the funnel over, see what's on the other side. So I'll just turn that over there, a few of the moths flying off. Which is one of the species which was used to illustrate the impacts of uh, pollution. And if we just drift down to this side here, sand, there's a, a lovely clouded silver moth. Okay, so let's lift the lid off now and see if we've got anything big, fat and juicy in there. Let's put those to the side. Okay. Right, there's a, a nice selection in there, you can see. Best to put the egg cartons around the, the margins of the trap, I find, and leave the centre fairly open. That one's sort of fallen in a bit. So not ordinarily the trap would be sort of arranged like that. So when the moths do enter the, into the trap, they've got a, a space in which they can sort of get access to the lower uh, ring of egg cartons. But it's really important, particularly as the summer comes around, that you put lots and lots of egg cartons in the moth trap as um, you can get some very big catches in some sites. I once had uh, over 1,500 large yellow underwings in one moth trap. That was quite remarkable seeing that. So obviously the more cartons the better. Okay, so I'm just going to take the cartons out one at a time and see what's on each one. Okay, if I can just uh, have that off your hand. So we'll go for one of the one of the classic favourites, which is the, the elephant hawk moth. Do, do you mind taking it, picking that up, sand with your finger? So that if you want to pick up a moth, the best way to do it is to put your finger underneath its nose and just gently get it to walk onto your finger. Um, and when they're in this sort of dorsal... So, um, so yeah, so you can pick that up. And if you want to photograph moths, uh, it's best to have some logs or stones handy that you can put them on. So if Sandra goes over there and puts the, the moth on the log, uh, you can photograph them in in a more sort of natural looking situation. So we'll just head on. So if you wanted to take some nice photographs on sort of, it's a wood, moss, uh, stones are very good if you get stones and, and moths, uh, or even sort of foliage as well is very good. So anyway, that's the, the elephant hawk moth, which is one of our more common hawk moths. Very common and I can guarantee whatever size garden you have, if you're on a trap, you'd catch one of these. Um, the, the larvae feed on willow herbs uh, and a range of other sort of common garden. Head on first. So that's the head of a buff tip moth. If I go sideways, it's got the most incredible pattern resembling a, a snapped off birch twig. And these are just, sorry, I'll just get, can you hold the carton, please? And there we are. And these are so confident in their camouflage, they're almost impossible to disturb. So if Sandra does the same thing again, 
and picks it up by putting her finger gently underneath its head, it will grab onto her finger and just continue looking like a stick, a bit of snapped off birch. It really is quite an amazing bit of camouflage. So that's the, the buff tip for caterpillar. So again, if Sandra can put that on the log over there, I'll move on to the next, the next moth. Okay, so this little moth here has got the most intricate markings. I'll try to keep a steady hand. This is the beautiful golden Y, and those markings in the centre of the wing, if you catch the light at the right angle, they've got this beautiful metallic um, sort of iridescence to them. I'm not quite sure what their function is. If I just turn it a little bit like that, you can see how striking those markings are. And it's got the most amazing array of lumps and bumps as well on the thorax and on the, the dorsal fringe of the folded wings there. Uh, fairly widespread, not particularly common moth, but it's, uh, it, it is one that most people would record in their garden. Um, just to give you an idea of the diversity of species uh, you can expect to find in a garden, our garden is fairly unremarkable other than the fact we plant lots of plants to attract moths and butterflies etc. Uh, but we've recorded over 700 species of moth uh, in our garden uh, over the 24-year sort of 20, year period. Uh, and Glamorgan list of species is about 1500. So we, we've had approximately half of all the species that occur in Glamorgan uh, within, within our very ordinary urban garden. Um, so I'm just going to put that to one side now while I see what else is in here. Uh, and just to put that into context, the number of species of moth and butterfly in Britain is two and a half thousand species. So they're a fantastically diverse uh, group of insects and a lot of them are very easy to identify. Um, now this is a day flying moth which clearly also flies at night for it to turn up in a moth trap. This is the cinnabar moth and um, its caterpillars feed on rag. I guess a lot of you will have seen their stripy black and yellow uh, and you'll see them on, on the flowers of ragwort and on the foliage of ragwort later on in the season. Uh, but obviously this time of year the adults are emerging. Um, these got these very distinctive colours which are warning colours for birds. Um, right, sorry let me just, uh, just turn the carton over. Now this is one of the, the more drab looking species. This is the, the treble lines, I guess it's as simple as put that moth on there please Sand. Okay, let me have a, a look, see what else is in here. Right then. So, this, so I'm just going to zoom out a bit, excuse the uh, terrible photography here. This is probably the, one of our commonest species called the heart and dart and it occurs in really sort of big numbers in the garden uh, and, and I, I, I guess like a, a lot of other common species they're, they're probably more important for their larval stages in that they help support sort of whole food systems so moths like the winter moth for example which flies in the middle of winter produces a massive abundance of caterpillars um, which are really important for birds such as uh, well Virtually all of our woodland birds are, are sort of dependent on, on the, the hatch of, of winter moths. Uh, and like I say, they do support really important ecosystems. Uh, and the probably same is true in gardens, although we don't, we don't really fully understand a lot of the, the larval stages. There's another beautiful golden Y. It's a fresher individual with nicer markings. Okay, let's have a little look. Oh yes, that's nice. There's a couple of species on the underside as well. So this is a species called the light emerald, um, which actually sits on the underside of leaves. There we are, sharpened up nicely. So this moth by day will be resting on the underside of leaves and, and the, winds, the wings are almost translucent light green. Uh, and those, those disruptive markings on the wing will obviously help the moth uh, remain camouflaged during the day. And just over to the right here, there's a quite a localised species which seems to be increasing. 
I think I'm actually getting, picking up my pulse through the air. So this is the orange footman, uh, which 10 years ago, I don't think we'd ever seen in our garden, but it's, it's something which turns up annually now. Um, and the footman moths feed on lichens. So they, they, you could consider them to be sort of good indicators of, of uh, improving air conditions, I guess. Although some lichens are, are very tolerant of pollution anyway. But anyway, that's the, the, the orange footman. Just over here is a, a dark arches, another one of these drab species, uh, which is quite common. Uh, now these drab species, I find, if you sort of really zoom in and look at their markings, they're, again, apologies for the, sh the shake, but just the complexity of markings on the wings is really quite amazing when you start looking at these, what appear to be brown drab things. And people say, oh, moths are boring and dull compared to butterflies, but uh, there are certainly plenty of species of moth which are which are very colourful. Um, right, I'm just going to have a little quick whiz through this. There's another cinnabar there, and another elephant hawk moth. Okay, so we've got a pale tussock here, which has uh, obviously done the rounds a bit. Now, obviously, moths live for in the adult phase for a relatively short period of time compared to the larval stages. And their main function is, we just focus on him. So when they get disturbed and they feel they've been ousted, they will often sort of warm themselves up um, because moths have got sort of a big muscle mass in the thorax. The larger species do need to warm up their thoracic muscles before they can fly. So um, very often they'll uh, start vibrating their wings to warm up their muscles so they can sort of fly off with more intent than rather just sort of flap off into the bushes. I think this one's decided now he's, uh, he's going to rely on his camouflage. So that's, mm -hmm. that's a male pale tussock. Right. Okay, I've just had a, a question come up saying, uh, how, how, can you identify a good resource for, for, for identifying moths? So, uh, it just so happens, I've got a, a line of books here on the side here. Uh, I thought someone might ask that question. So um, <clears throat> there's a whole range of books that you can get to identify moths. There really are masses and masses. So this is just a, a tiny part of my sort of reference collection of moths. Uh, the one over there, The Moths and Butterflies of Great Britain and Ireland, that big, there's actually 10 volumes covering um, the British moth fauna. Uh, but there's lots of specialist books. Uh, the the Br uh, British Wildlife Publication on Moths. They do a book on macro moths and a book on micro moths. Oh, there's the micro moth book. Thank you, Sand. So, if you when, generally when you start looking at moths, you start looking at the macro moths, which are the generally the bigger, easier to identify ones, which have all got English names. Once you get a bit experienced, people tend to think, oh, that little micro moth. A lot of them, which actually really beautifully coloured, uh, mm -hmm. but. Most of them don't have common vernacular names, uh, but the but this, this is an excellent book. Uh, but this one is probably my favourite one. This is one uh, written by Chris Manley, who uh, who used to live not far from where we are here in Gosinan, but he's now moved to Carmarthenshire, and he's produced this spectacular book, which has basically got all of the uh, moths you ever like to see in Britain. Um, illustrated beautifully uh, in their natural resting positions so the it does macro moths and micro moths i just find i'll just flick through some of the plates they're arranged in such a way that you can really just compare them um sort of side by side um and it, it is a really excellent book because it does show you the moths as they appear in the field whereas some of the older field guides like skinner for example which was my bible for years and years um the plates actually show pin specimens which obviously reveals characters of the underwing you wouldn't see in in the in a resting moth and it is very useful but i think these days there's you can actually uh, uh i think it's it's a it's a lot better just to to look at them in their natural resting positions in fact the way the wings are arranged often is a is a very good identification feature uh, there are sort of specialist books so this is quite a, a sort of a good one. This one is actually on bird dropping tortrix moths. So these are examining bird droppings in the, in the hope they find a moth. Good luck. <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, we'll go back to the moths now and see what's inside here. Um, I'm going to delve a little bit deeper, see if I can find something a bit more interesting. Right, if I, if I take the lid, the, the funnel off, 
Oh, look at this. Yeah, there's a nice mix of things here. So these moths have decided they like this bit of paper. So texture is quite important. So we've got um, we've got an elephant hawk moth there. We've got a poplar hawk moth, a lobster moth, a ribboned wave, a little micro moth called Chrysotusha clamella, a cinnabar moth, and on the thing over here is a light emerald again. Now lobster moths are wonderful things. They've got the most crazy caterpillars, uh, which is what gives the moth its name. Uh, so Victorian entomologists were much more adept at finding caterpillars than we, we are today. We're very lazy, generally. We'll just stick a moth trap out. It, it's a great way to catch moths because you can just put a light on, have a good night's sleep, get up in the morning and, and just go through the moth trap. But uh, that's a, uh, much better than we do these days. And uh, so the lobster moth caterpillar is really spectacular. Rather than me describe it, I suggest you Google it uh, and just see how wacky it really is. Uh, can you put a couple of those moths on the log sand so I can show the camouflage uh, in a second? Right, there's another poplar hawk. Oh, look, this is nice. So we got a couple of... So this is the, the privet hawk moth uh, and, a, and a poplar hawk moth side by side. So these are two of our biggest moths we get in the UK. Um, and, and if I, um, sorry, a question just come through saying, what's my favourite moth? <laughs> uh, I guess I don't really have one, to be honest. Um, I, I just, I like all moths. I think even the little ones, even the little drab brown ones are quite exciting. Um, sorry, sorry to come up with a, a undefinitive answer. But um, I think what I really like these days is trying to understand moth uh, moth life histories so understanding what their associations are with plants so for example the privet hawk moth if i just turn my phone to the left here we have a nice privet hedge which uh it'd be surprising you'd think a dull manicured privet hedge is um is fairly dull for wildlife but it, it's amazing what actually lives in there not just moth wise uh wildlife and min moth which i'll try and focus on there we are that's rather spectacular. It's struggling to focus on because we're both moving in different directions. If I just go back to the poplar hawk, uh, the privet hawk moth, sorry. Sam, can you do me a favour and just move its wing to show its its um, its abdomen? They've got very, very strikingly marked abdomens. Um, and they, they've, they often sort of flash warning colours, hawk moths. So Sandra's Sandra going to annoy this now. Oop, Sandra... Uh, there we are. So look at look at those markings. Let me just put that down. If I just do that, look at those lovely colours on the on the uh, the abdomen. Oops. Yeah, leave yeah, even there. He's fine. And what he's doing is he's basically showing his his sort of shocking colours. So if I was a predator now, I might be sort of warned off by the by the striking colours. Even even the underside is pretty remarkable. Again, I think if I put that on a if we put that on a log sand. Oops. While Sandra's doing that, I'm just going to show you this little carpet moth. This is a little geometer moth. This is a clouded border. Um, a pretty little thing. And some of these drab noctuid moths again. That's a marbled minor species. Uh, there are some moths you can only identify with 100% confidence by doing genitalia dissections. It's not something I do. Um, Oops, sorry, let's... Oh, there's a nice one as well. So we've got a... a sorry, I'm just going to... Instead of holding a phone and things like that. So this one over here... This is a... This is a campion moth. <clears throat> He's got... I don't know if you can see this sort of slight pinkish tinge to those cross lines. So the markings you can see on the wings, they're called stigmata. And they're very helpful in identification. And the two stigmata, those big oval shapes, sort of a, a joined, almost joined on this species. But the pink coloration on the on this band towards the, the towards the sort of tip of the wing is is quite distinctive. And these moths feed on campions, uh, and it's very easy to get the species in your garden just simply by planting red campion or white campion in your garden. Uh, and if you if you do plant those species and check, uh, perhaps in a month's time you'll see they're being eaten by caterpillars. The caterpillars actually go inside the seed pods and munch away quite happily at the, the capsules. So there's a lot you can do in your garden to actually attract 
uh, moths into your garden by planting the right food. Interested in these days is, is is understanding the ecology of these moths. Okay. Right. This is one of the swift moths. These are one of the most primitive moth families, so I'm just going to zoom in a bit so I can get a better shot of it. Where's he gone? So this is the common... Let's see what else is under there. There's a... another treble lines. I'm just going to zoom out. And tucked into this little compartment here is a clouded board of brindle. Okay. Oh, there's a nice one. This is this is beautiful. So this one here is called the peach blossom moth. I'm not sure the camera's picking up those lovely peachy tones, um, but it really does look like its wings have been adorned by little pink petals. Uh, and I always, rightly or wrongly, seem to associate this with like nice bramble thickets. So a bramble is a very much undervalued habitat for wildlife. Um, it, it does support an incredibly rich array of species. Flowers obviously provide massive amounts of nectar for bees um, um, and obviously moths. So the other thing, I think another issue, not an issue, sorry, another, another thing with understanding of moths is how important they are as a pollinator uh, group. So at night there are so many different species who are actually going around sort of pollinating flowers. Um, 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 so I'm just trying to get a better view of that. Yeah, that. Here comes uh, here comes one of our top predators. To see what's lurking around the moth trap, the blackbird. <laughs> I say he is always there in the morning when I do the moth trap. So, right again, if you can put that on the log sand, that'd be lovely. But he is the, the blackbird is so tame now. I he will literally just come and pick moths from alongside me. So. It's very important, again, if you do set moths, uh, moth traps, that you do sort of look after your moths. So ensuring that one, or you tap them out in some dense vegetation where the birds aren't going to get them. So this is a nice woodland species called the marble brown. Um, I think it's, food, it's larval food plant is oak, although I'm not 100% sure. But uh, yeah, you generally find this in, in woodland sites, but it does turn up in the garden every now and then. And I can see another species of hawk moth. So this is our fourth species of hawk moth now. We've had the elephant hawk moth, the privet hawk moth, and the poplar hawk moth. And this is a small elephant hawk moth. I don't know if you can get one of those other elephant sand and put them side by side to see the, the differences. As well as the size, they do have sort of differences in their markings. Oh, here comes Sandra with a a large elephant hawk moth as it's sometimes referred but not massively larger but um, it's got more stripy wings oh, you can see it's starting to warm his thorax up now so you can see that sort of uh, shimmering movement as he starts to uh, prepare for flight sorry this is focusing it's hopeless right if you just pop him on the carton perhaps he'll settle down next to the next to the small elephant okay Let's have a look down here. I'm just going to go under the side of the moth trap now. So this is a this is called a sharp angle peacock moth. Okay, someone's asked a question: Why are they called elephant hawk moths? Um, I honestly never been asked that question before, and I don't know. I'm I'm guessing it could be because the caterpillars do resemble an elephant's trunk. The caterpillar's got this most amazing, um, but I guess they they could also have a, a vague resemblance to a to a, to a, an elephant's trunk. So that, that's my guess, rather than a, a definitive answer. Anyway, I've got some nice moths on this lovely mm -hmm. yellow-coloured mm -hmm. carton here. Okay, this is another lobster moth, which curiously sits with his hind wings projecting forward of his forewings which when it's sitting on a, on a shape of a moth so in in sort of in its defense of avoiding predators it, it looks less like them it's sort of traditional moth shape and it also helps sort of feather the wings into the, the shape of the tree 
But there's there's another very lovely species here called the burning. Let's get the shimmer on the wing. Right, so this is the burnished brass moth, and you can see if I turn the if I angle it slightly, you can see the sort of uh, the brashy shimmer on the wings. So this belongs to a family of moths called the plusids, which often have these metallic scales on the wings. So if I just do that, very nice burnished brass. There's another. Um, peach blossom there. One of the pug moths, notoriously difficult to identify. That looks like a common pug, but it's a bit too worn to even identify. Tussock sitting with his furry legs stretched out in front of him. Very cute. And uh, and just against there, there's another light emerald green carpet. So I say just on just in one of the egg cartons you've got a nice little mixture of species there. Just put that over there. Wow, how are we doing for time? So look at this uh, lobster moth. Sorry? Can you uh so put that on the log again? I'll go over to the log in a moment. I'll 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 just show you some of the moths in more natural positions. I'll just life trying to trying, trying to get here. So sorry, I'm just uh just checking some of these cartons to see if there's anything a bit different to show you. It was actually um, not the, the best night last night. What you tend to find is if you've got a bright moon at night, the catch isn't anywhere near as good as if you've got a cloudy, close, muggy night. So the ideal night for, for trapping moths really is a nice, humid, still night. Um, with no moon, um, so this is a this is an iron prominent. I'm going to show you now. Um, again, the light's not brilliant in here. Try and focus it. So the iron prominent, you can see those sort of rusty stains. Oh yes, and we've just brought over the burnished brass, which is now preparing for takeoff. You can see those uh, shimmering brassy colours on the wings now. Absolutely beautiful thing. So as I say, what he's doing is warming up his thoracic muscles so that when he flies he's he's fully he's sort of uh, fully capable because obviously once they're in flight they're very much at uh, risk of being spotted by birds, particularly if they're flying during the daytime. Oh there we are, look at that, that's beautiful. Um, so they'd much prefer to crawl off into the vegetation than fly because as soon as they take flight in the day they know they're going to be vulnerable to uh, to predators. Um, so that's why it's really important. They've, they've got their body temperature up to speed. Okay, we have um, another one of the geometer moths again. Oops. This is a, a willow beauty, which as you can imagine when he's sitting on a, a rugged tree trunk will be very difficult to spot in nature. Uh, but obviously in a moth trap, dead easy. Um, uh, what else have we got here? Well, treble lions, heart and darts. There's another white ermine. White ermines are pretty amazing moths. They've just got such lovely colours. And if I try... You know, these often sort of feign death. Um, I'm just going to tap them out into my hand a sec. I'm going to show you the... Can you hold the on, Sam, please? I just want to show the the colours on the underside of the of the the abdomen. So lovely sort of spots. And it, I say he's not dead. He's just sort of feigning death. He's, he's perfectly fine. Um, but if I just do that, he'd just pretend to be dead. If I tickle his belly, is he going to get annoyed at me? No. There we there we are. Oh yeah, I see he's having a bit. He's trying to find oops, there he goes. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just gonna quickly go through this to see if there's anything really exciting. Um I think we've done well anyway with the hawk moths. There's a purple clay there. I'll just say some of the names. Oh that yeah, the marble brown, which we've seen earlier. 
the woodland species. Um, there's another elephant hawk moth. I mean, I, I love the underside of the elephant hawk moth. If I just go over here and put them on the, on the log in more natural sort of setting. I just look. So if, if anyone's interested in photography, um, obviously getting a good macro lens is really uh, makes a massive difference to the quality of the photographs. Sorry, I miss that. Why does it matter if the moth is dead to a bird? Uh, well, it, it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, obviously the bird, uh, the moth just pretends. Sorry, the moth just pretends it's it's dead because because what normally normally happens is they they'll feign death and they'll basically wriggle a bit. So what normally happens then they drop into the into the foliage and, and remain hidden. But I think in the case of the white ermine, because it's got those bright colours on the underside of its body, it's basically revealing the fact it probably doesn't taste very nice. So I'm just going to focus on one or two of these and if I can. Oh, where are you going? Oh, the privet haunt moth, yeah. Let me just go for one or two nice steady shots of these these moths. So I'm going to focus on the privet haunt moth head. See if I, whoops. She's in a bit of a funny position there. Yeah, look at those antennae on that. That really is a beast of a moth. Absolutely beautiful. Um, the pale tussock again just lovely lovely furry legs uh, where's the lobster oh, there's the lobster moth so the lobster moth is shown how he sort of puts his hind wings forward and presses them against the the bark makes himself very well camouflaged oops peppered moth as I say Industrial melanism uh, is it was something which occurred in this species uh, during the sort of industrial period, and the, what they found is moths that were, were um, found in very polluted areas turned almost jet black, and uh, whereas moths in more cleaner rural settings with this lovely peppered colour became pro progressively lighter, and as industrial sort of pollution eased off, the number of black peppered moths also started to decline in response. So it's like a case of, sort of microevolution. There's the elf top moth. I say this one he's getting ready for takeoff so let me let's see if I can get him in the ice. So he's warming his wings up nicely. Look at that lovely pink coloration. I do apologise for the poor focusing, it's entirely my fault. And just a couple more, so I've got the, the small elephant to the right and the, the, the ordinary elephant to the left. Okay. <clears throat> I think, to be honest, I've still got more moths to go through. Um, so let's have a quick look in what's in our other trap here. Oh, there's a nice little moth there. One of these micro moths. Do, some of them do have common name. The scientific name of this one is called Arch Archips Padana. I think it's called a, one of the bell moths. Um, let's, let's see, a very few moths in, in this trap. We've got a straw dot over here. I say it, re it really just, it just demonstrate the, the diversity of, of shapes, form and colour of, of this group. Oh yes, yeah, so you, you get other, other groups of insects in the trap this year. And over here there's a, a moth called the poplar grey. This lovely grey camouflaged pattern on his wings. The pattern on the wings by the way is formed by scales and it's like a, a mosaic. It's a, a darker peppered moth there. Still not anywhere near the black form. So the Basically, the, the pattern of scales on the wing is... Oh, there's a small elephant in, in this trap as well. 
Yeah, he's really getting ready to go now, this one. I'm give him a gentle shove. He must be he must be ready now. He's been buzzing for ages. Oh, there he goes. Oh, he's off. <laughs> this little cluster of heart and darts and treble lines. There's a another campion there. So uh, pepper moths. Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to. Oh, there's a buff ermine there. Look, that's a nice one. So you've seen the white ermine. This is the the buff ermine. Fairly descriptive. Darts. There's a moth called the flame in there. There's another one that looks a bit like a twig. So if I just uh, I do that. There's the flame moth. Small elephant hawk. Wow, that's a beautifully fresh specimen. So when the when the moths emerge, they are incredibly um, fresh scaled. But this time of year is an excellent time of year for for new new emergences. As I'm seeing there. Oh, there's a lovely coronet there. This is the dark form of the coronet. Let me just zoom in on that sand. My tea. And so, if people do want to see what's happening in the moth world, you can you can visit uh, some of the some excellent websites and blogs. Butterfly Conservation do a lot for moths. Um, <clears throat> the Glamorgan Moth Recording Group has got a. A website and blog which is not as active as other ones in adjacent counties in Carmarthenshire for example or Monmouthshire they've got very active and really interesting blogs which you can follow to see what people have been trapping and help and if you need help with identification um, there's a lot of friendly moth people out there who are always keen to help out as I say the Carmarthenshire, Glamorgan and Monmouthshire got very active um, moth recording groups who are very helpful um, so you don't necessarily need to go out and buy lots of books some people uh, just enjoy photographing them putting their photographs on and getting help but uh, I find that the more you understand these insects the more you sort of uh, appreciate their diversity their importance oh there's a lovely little bug there look at him Don't recognise him. So very, very often the sort of the the moth bycatch, as I call it, includes little bugs, caddisflies, and uh, oh yeah, there's a thistle ermin over there. Okay. This is uh, just zoom in a bit. Oops. Yeah, it's it's. Let me see if I can get it. Oh, oh it's gone. Out. Sorry. Um. So it's really difficult to concentrate when they're going through the trap. Let me just see if there's... Any... Oh, there's a bee moth there. There's a, a nice bee moth. So these are associated with beehives. There are a few pest species. Uh, like There are a few species which beekeepers aren't very keen on. Uh, the wax moths. Um, but in terms of clothes moths, I think we live in such a fairly sterile... Um, so environment in our homes these days, clothes moths are a bit of a thing of the past really unless you've got a, a sort of a, a, an older house and you've got lots of natural fabrics. Um, they do turn. I, I have visited a few people's houses who have clothes moth problem. It doesn't mean they're not clean. It just means they've got lots of natural fabrics and they're living in a very organic way which, uh, which there's nothing wrong with that that's for sure. Um, but I say clothes moths um, very often associate with birds' nests as well. So you do you do get them sort of turning up in in uh, in, in homes quite regularly. Uh, but they they rarely do damage to clothes these days. That's a bright line brown eye, which is quite a common species. A lot of these moth names are quite descriptive. 
This one's perhaps not so descriptive if you don't know your, your Hebrew characters. He's just disappeared at the bottom of that area. He's called a Cetaceous Hebrew character. I'm just going to go down to the bottom of the trap and show you the Cetaceous Hebrew character. As I say, if somebody knows their Hebrew alphabet, perhaps they recognise a Hebrew character on there, but uh, I certainly don't. Um, I think we've, I say, without going through this systematically, I think we've probably seen a, very, a good enough selection of moths now to uh, hopefully satisfy most people's needs. I'm just going to check if there's... Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to say one final thing really on recording. It's lovely to see all these moths, but it's really important that if you do see moths, that you make an effort to record them. Because they do help, they do provide us a good indication of the sort of the health of our environment. And uh, there are, there's a whole team of moth people who submit their records to um, local record centres, and these get passed on to national data sets, and help monitor the health of our invertebrate populations in the UK. Uh, and unfortunately, as we all know too well these days, that most species are in decline. Uh, but not all species, there are some positive stories as well. Uh, but it's really important that uh, if you do record moths, that you make the effort to, to re re record them and send in the records to, uh, to the appropriate schemes. So on that point, I shall say thank you very much for listening. And, uh, and I hope you find out that garden moths are a bit more sort of varied than perhaps you first thought. So thank you very much from us here in Gosainen. Bye bye.